Hey Lightweights, welcome back to some more lore lessons with Lightweight. It has been a while. I'm super behind because I had the world's worst stomach bug that ended up being some variant of COVID. And when I tell you it wiped me out, I'm not even going to get into the gory details, but I don't think I have ever been that sick in terms of expulsion <laughs> in my entire life. It was horrible. So anyways, we're back with more lessons. Um, have some catching up to do today. So, oops, sorry. I think we left off talking about, we talked about Mimir's peace plan. And then I was gonna get into Odin and Freya. Um, and I was just gonna do that. Odin and Freya talk about Balder and Freya and the Valkyrie, so it was just gonna be a Freya video. Um, but now that I have less time, I think this is gonna be a Freya video, but it's also going to be about um, Brock and Sindri as well. So we're going to kind of cover multiple topics. So we're gonna start with Freya, um, go to Brock and Sindri and talk about their weaponry, um, which will be fun. So this one might be a little bit longer, but that's okay. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell button when you do, so that you know when I post future videos, because I'm back, starting today. We're having lore lessons with Lightweight every day till we get to Ragnarok, and we're getting so close. Okay, are you ready? Subscribe, hit that bell button. Did you do it? Okay, here you go. Starting off with Odin and Freya. I still found it hard to picture Freya married to a cruel guy like Odin. But Mimir says Odin actually has a soft side buried deep under all his bluster. After he lost... <laughs> after he lost Fjorgen... Fjorgen? Who he truly loved, he got really lonely. But as war with the Vanir raged, Mimir says he could sense that the Aesir king wanted someone like Fjorgen again. That's how I came up with the idea of a union, said Mimir. And at first, it looked brilliant. Odin really turned on the charm. He seemed happy, interested in making her happy. He granted her so many wishes I can scarcely recall them all. The peace held, and I truly believed all had worked out better than I could have planned. But Odin's true face showed itself eventually. After he won Freya's trust, she taught him some of her Vanir magic. Another choice she would live to bitterly regret, according to Mimir. Dabbling in Vanir magic led Odin to new forms of experimentation and, as Mimir says, new levels of depravity. All right, so we are going to stop and talk about an actual lore marker in the game next. Um, beware of the cider. I never feel like I say that right, and then I always hear it in the game, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's how you say it, but then I can never actually remember. So we're going with cider. And I know my pronunciation is horrendous, and I apologize to those of you who can pronounce it. Um, so beware of cider. Beware of cider and those who practice it. Their sorcery is insidious and ever-changing, and so are the souls who master it. The more power they summon, the less they are themselves. And if you recall from the game, the um, revenants, or the kind of women-looking things in the cloaks that float above the ground, and they have the giant staffs and they shoot balls of poison at you, they're a pain in the ass when you have multiples of them. They're wicked fast and you can't just hit them. Um, so those were the bane of my existence a lot of times. One-on-one, -on -one, they were fine, but when you get multiples of them and a bunch of other little guys running around or big guys running around, or I remember in, where was the poison place again? Niflheim? Um, when you were doing the realm tears there, there was like two revenants who practiced cider magic on top of a bunch of little guys. And then there was also like a troll at the same time. It was just a pain in the butt. They're a pain in the butt. They're a pain in the butt. Um, so yeah, those will be fun next game, I'm sure. All right, um, so let's, I'm going to skip around a little bit. So um, I did skip one section. I'm gonna skip a couple and just focus on the Freya ones first. And then I'll kind of go back and I'll talk about Mimir's eyes are randomly in here. Um, and I'll talk about Brock and Sindri and stuff like that as well. So we're gonna skip a section and we're gonna go to Baldur's Curse because as we know from last game, Baldur is Freya's son. Uh, so Baldur's Curse. A few years after marrying Odin, Freya gave birth to a son. Mimir says that Baldur became the center of Freya's life the moment he entered the world. A prophecy revealed that Freya's young son would meet an untimely death, 
so she went crazy and spent the next 20 years trying to find a way to save him. Freya asked Mimir for his advice, and he reluctantly agreed to help. He assisted her in finding a special divination spell that could render Baldur invulnerable to harm. As an experienced sorceress, Freya knew it was dangerous to cast any spell on a loved one, much less a divination spell, but she was desperate and out of options. The spell worked, but there were consequences. Baldur was protected from harm, but he could feel no pleasure or pain. As a result, says Mimir, this alienated Baldur from the from the libertine Aesir culture. From then on, he seethed with burning resentment at his mother's interference in his life. One other thing, almost every protection enchantment has a built-in weakness. When Freya cast her spell on Baldur, she and Mimir both knew that only one thing, mistletoe, could penetrate its protection. Freya didn't want to take any chances, so she magically clouded Mimir's mind, erasing any memories of the spell's details. So every time we asked Mimir about it, he could only repeat, Boulder is blessed with invulnerability to all threats, physical or magical. So I recently replayed um, God of War 2018 uh, because, you know, I am going crazy waiting for God of War Ragnarok. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting because obviously after you play the game, you know Mistletoe is Baldur's weakness. Um, but I thought it was really cool how they allowed that to come through and how they showed that to you. So obviously Sindri gives Atreus the Mistletoe arrows after you fight your first dragon when you're going to the top of the mountain. Um, but when you see Freya again, she's like, those are horrible, those are evil, you cannot use those, and she gets rid of them, except for the one little piece that they incorporated into him keeping, because earlier, Atreus' um, quiver of arrows breaks, and he keeps holding on to it, and Kratos says, no, if you do that, you're going to get injured or killed because you're distracted, um, and we can't have faulty weaponry. So he takes a tiny piece of one of Atreus's arrows that they've just gotten and he fashions it to be like a splint for Atreus's uh, quiver. So when Freya takes those mistletoe arrows, she doesn't take the piece that is attached to his quiver, which is really cool because then later on when you fight Baldur, Baldur punches Atreus and knocks the wind out of him. And there's a whole really hard warming scene where Kratos is holding Atreus in his arms and Atreus is trying to catch up his breath and trying to breathe and if you've been winded before or seen anyone who's had the wind completely knocked out of them it's that terrifying moment of you can't get air into your lungs um so kratos is panicking holding atreus saying breathe breathe and when atreus can breathe um he says that's not my blood because when balder punches atreus he punches the mistletoe little splint on um atreus's quiver so I think that's really, really cool because then now that's how they learn um, mistletoe is what can break the spell. Now Baldur is not invulnerable anymore. Um, so it was just a really cool way that they did that. And again, it just shows you how amazing the writing is because they had to think of all these tiny little details. Um, and I'm not a writer, so I don't know, maybe that's like an easy thing to do. But to me, that seems like a really cool way to answer the question of how do you be Baldur in a subtle, unique way. And I loved that. So, Baldur's Curse, Mistletoe, Arrows, Atreus. And now perfectly going to lead into Brock and Sindri um, because Sindri is the one who fashions the Mistletoe Arrows unintentionally helping them out in the long run. Okay, um, so let's talk about Freya and the Valkyries and then that will be it for Freya for this video, I think. So Freya and the Valkyries. Mother told many stories of the Valkyries, the winged warrior spirits known as the Choosers of the Slain, who select which fallen warriors are worthy of going on to Valhalla or Folkvanir. Folkvanger. Oh, boy. When Father and I finally liberated Sigrun, the Valkyrie Queen, she told us something really surprising. Sigrun insisted that the nine Valkyries believed they had only one true queen, the goddess Freya. Mimir confirmed this, telling us that during her years in Asgard, Freya was granted command of the Valkyries as part of her marriage compact with Odin, adding Valkyrie wings to her warrior spirit. In return, Freya fulfilled Odin's desire to learn the way of Cider, not realizing it was only feeding his crazy obsession with preventing Ragnarok. 
Mimir told us that as Freya witnessed Odin's continued corrupt use of her magic, she found it impossible to deny his bad intent. She stayed in Asgard for years for the sake of peace, but during that time she grew apart from her mad spouse. When they finally broke apart, Odin snatched away Freya's Valkyrie wings and her warrior spirit. Sigrun told us more about it. When Odin sir I'm sorry, when Odin severed Freya's wings, I served in her absence, but it wasn't enough for the Allfather. He used an archaic piece of magic to corrupt my sisters. I tried to contain the damage by imprisoning them in places where they could cause no harm, but soon I lost myself as well. Luckily, Father and I managed to free all nine of the Valkyrie spirits from their corrupted physical forms by defeating each one. But now, according to Mimir, Freya is out searching for her warrior spirit again. She's still really mad at us for killing her son, so there's no telling what she'll do if she finds those lost wings. All right, now at this point, I am gonna talk briefly about Ragnarok trailer stuff. So um, I'm gonna come back to the reading. So if you wanna fast forward a bit, but I also don't want you to accidentally hear things you don't wanna hear. So just continue on um, at your own risk. Um, maybe I'll hold the book up when I start reading from the book again, so you can look for that if you want to keep watching. Um, but here's your warning. I'm talking about Ragnarok trailer stuff now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So in the trailer, we do see what looks to be a Valkyrie fight, which is really interesting. And I'm wondering if we're actually fighting Freya in one of those, because it looks like two Valkyries are attacking us at the same time, which one Valkyrie is hard enough. <laughs> two! Whew! Um, but I'm wondering if one of those is Freya. Um, maybe she gets her warrior spirit and her wings back somehow. So I'm not sure, but that would be really cool. And also terrifying. But could be. Could be Freya is back in her Valkyrie form. Who knows what she'd be willing to do to get revenge on us for killing her son. I'm pretty sure she would do just about anything. So, all right. Um, so now, now we're spoiler free again. Um, now I'm going to get into Brock and Sindri, um, but I think I'm going to read, um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit talking about Mother of Thor, who I did briefly talk about when Odin married Freya. I had skipped this segment, um, but we'll talk about that because I think that will lead us nicely into the Haldra brothers, Brock and Sindri, because they're the ones who made um, Mjolnir, I'm pretty sure if I remember from the game. So um, let's talk about Thor's mother. And then we'll talk about Brock and Sindri and the creation of Mjolnir and the Leviathan X. All right, so again, sorry mis for mispronouncing all of these, but Fjorgen, mother of Thor. Back before I found out the truth about my own mom, Mimir told me about Thor's mother. We were traveling, and I told him I couldn't believe Odin and Freya were ever married. He said, Love and hate are more closely intertwined than you might imagine, lad. For instance, Odin hates the giants, and they him, but Thor's own mother was a giantess, giantess, Fjorgen, one of Odin's great loves. It's pretty ironic, I guess, because I remember my reply. I said, so Thor is half god and half giant? Weird. But of course, now I know that Thor and I share the same mix in our blood. Now that's weird. Um, and again, we have a lore marker from the game called Rites of Fjorgen. Here we bear witness to the funeral rites of Fjorgen of the Jotnar, goddess of the earth and trees. For her beauty, she was seduced. For her love, she was betrayed. And for her gift of life, her life was claimed. To the summit and across the bridge, she shall be born, where nevermore the thunder may find her. And then there's a little note from Atreus underneath it. Did Thor kill his own mother? Was that the first giant he killed? What does it mean? So... In God of War 2018, we um, see how Thor kind of goes on a rampage against the Jotnar. Um, he kills, oh, I, this might not be the right name, but I think Thalmer. Was he the giant one where we take his his um, ice pick? I think it's Thalmer. I think he's a giant one that you can see in the map and you go like under his corpse and on. And you, okay. Um, so he kills him, uh, and then we also, by the end of it, hear stories of Thor going on a rampage and killing all the Jotnar, um, and that's kind of why they fled Midgard and 
tier shut off realm travel there. Um, so it would be interesting if that was the first giant, if his mother was the first giant he killed, and also why would he have killed her? So I don't really know if we're going to get more into that or not. Um, but definitely an interesting thought. All right, so now let's backtrack and go to the Hulger brothers, which are Brock and Sindri. Um, and I want to talk about them now because they are, if I recall correctly, the creators of um, Mjolnir and also the creators of the Leviathan X. So that'll be interesting. Again, quick spoilers for trailers for Ragnarok, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, we see Mjolnir and the Leviathan X going head to head. Um, so that's definitely interesting to me. Okay, continuing on. The Halder Brothers. Everybody agrees that our good friends Brock and Sindri, known as the Halder Brothers, are the greatest dwarven blacksmiths ever, which is pretty cool. But as Mimir has explained, after they crafted the most powerful weapon ever made, they gave it to the wrong guys. Brock and Sindri made Mjolnir, Thor's hammer. Mimir calls it the Aesir's greatest murder weapon, the Bane of Giant Kind. He says the brothers crafted it many years ago when they were eager to make a name for themselves. But as he says, rather overdid it with that one, methinks. <laughs> After they delivered Mjolnir to Asgard, Thor's crazy killing spree began. The brothers still feel guilty about creating that hammer. Mimir says that every time news of another giant's death would reach them, they would start quarreling and blaming each other. Sindri told me they tried to restore a balance by forging a powerful new weapon, the Leviathan Axe, and then gave it to the giantess guardian of Midgard, my mother, Faye. Both brothers have told me they liked mother a lot and they really miss her now. After the Halter brothers split up, Sindri wanted to expand his skills beyond weapon making, so he sought out knowledge in Vanaheim. Among other things, he learned how to harness the power of dragon's teeth. Brock stayed focused on weapons. We heard he got kicked out of Elfheim for some kind of drunken rampage. One last thing, Mother always told me that Haldra were sprites of the forest. Mimir confirms this, saying Haldra sprites are beautiful and seductive. But when I asked why Brock and Sindri are called Haldra then, Mimir told me that my ears are too young and innocent to hear. I don't get it. Hmm, I don't know. Okay, just kidding. We've got one more section on Freya, and then we will... Stop there. All right, so we also have Freya's banishment. Mimir said that Freya was better to Odin than the Aesir king deserved, sticking it out through all manner of indignities, all in the name of maintaining peace and safety for her people. For example, when a giant king named Thrym stole Mjolnir, you can read about Thrym later, Odin offered to trade Freya for the hammer's return, but it was a trick. When Thor grabbed Mjolnir and started attacking the giant's court, Freya stepped in to stop the slaughter. This made Odin really angry, of course. After that, things got worse and worse. His madness, his tyranny, his corruption of her magics, it became more than Freya could stomach, and at long last, she broke it off, says Mimir. Odin's wrath was fierce, and his curses upon her were worse than she dared to fear. I figured Freya's magic would be stronger than Odin's, but Mimir says that after so much time together, Odin knew Freya's vulnerabilities and exploited them to cast cider curses she could never break. He trapped her in Midgard and sealed off Vanaheim from the rest of the realms, so now Freya can't go home to her Vanir tribe. Plus, Odin robbed her of her warrior spirit. She can't even fight to defend herself. No living thing may she harm by blade nor spell, says Mimir. And worst of all, her beloved son Baldur chose to stay with his father, angrily declaring he never wanted to see her again. Stripped of her Valkyrie rings and her weapons made useless, Freya isolated herself in the sanctuary grove of Midgard. There she made friends with Charlie, the giant tortoise who shelters her house. I like that guy. Her only other companion is Hildisvini, a Vanir shapeshifter stuck in the form of a boar who I almost killed with an arrow. Man, I really felt bad about that. Holy shit! Holy shit! Okay, okay, okay. I knew she said the boar was the last of its kind, but I thought it was just a boar. I thought it was just a magic boar. I was like, okay, that's like obviously sad because you don't want you don't want an entire species to be eliminated. I didn't realize it was a Vanir shapeshifter who was stuck as a boar. 
No wonder she was so emotional about it. I also didn't know, I must have missed this conversation with Mimir, but I didn't realize she wasn't, she couldn't. Um, no living thing may she harm by blade or spell. So I didn't realize she couldn't like attack or defend people until she found her warrior spirit. So that means, again, spoilers for Ragnar trailer, that means when we see that scene of her attacking Kratos and Atreus, she must have already found it. So that really makes me think that that Valkyrie fight is going to involve her. Interesting. Now, I also understand why she was very much just on the defensive between Kratos and Baldur's fight in the 2018 game, because I never really understood that. I was like, she's so magical. Why doesn't she just like knock Baldur out or something or us? Um, and I thought, I like I I kind of thought like why didn't she kill us right then and there, um, but I thought maybe her anger and her resentment kind of grew over time, which happens, you know, when you get that little seed of anger and then it just grows and grows and grows. And if she's lonely and now she's lost her son, maybe at first she didn't want to kill us, but over time. Um, but that makes sense now. She's not allowed to attack us. She physically couldn't. Um, so instead, she was doing defensive measures to try to stop the fighting. Interesting. Okay, and there was a scroll marker as well um, called Vanaheim Sealed. Our vengeance upon the Vanir gods is at hand. Their realm is isolated by Odin's spellcraft and infiltrated pre presently by his chosen Ein Her Yar. Ein Her Yar. Hmm. Their absence may be long felt by our folk, but we will keep up the Allfather's work in Midgard. Our priority remains Jotunheim, the Raven Keeper. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Okay. Hmm. Learning some good stuff, you guys. Uh, all right, so next time we are gonna talk about Odin a little bit more. Um, we'll talk about Thor's children as well. Um, we'll talk about Tyr and the withdrawal from Midgard by the giants. And then end with what does Yodin, Yodin? <laughs> What does Yodin want? What does Odin want? So we will finish up the lore markers next video. Um, then there are a couple Tales of the Giants that I wanna go through that as I was replaying the game, I realized there was a couple that would be important for us to read through. So we'll do that. Um, and then we will talk about um, Fimble Winter. Also, there is a timeline. I don't know if you guys would want to read through that as well. It's much more in depth, so it would be a longer video. It's, I think, two pages. Yeah, two pages long. Um, and I can go through that timeline as well if you would want. So just let me know um, in the comments and then I'll just adjust how much I put into each video so that I can do a video on that as well um, if you're interested in that timeline. So yeah, we learned a lot of really good things. Um, I don't necessarily have any final thoughts because I gave my thoughts more um, intermixed there, but I do feel like a lot of that lore could tie into some potential plot points for Ragnarok, which I'm really excited about. <sighs> I don't think I can handle my excitement anymore, guys. We're getting so close and all the reviews are so good. Okay, read the reviews if you haven't because holy fork and shirt balls. And yeah, I'll be back tomorrow with some more Lore Lessons with Lightweight. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell button when you do so that you don't miss a single thing. And like I said, let me know in the comments below if you would like to see that timeline as well. Um, I'll just adjust how much I put into each video in order to make sure I can do that for you guys if you would like to see it. All right. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and have an amazing day.